funding is based on <laughs> funding is based on um, enrollment, and the Student Opportunity Act takes into consideration certain wealth factors, meaning there is a bump for students of who are English as second language learners, special needs, and there's a ver variety of metrics that we can go over. Um, I know that Brian Callahan had asked specifically about the 14% increase in out of school district placement cost. So first I wanna address why that was. Uh, it is my understanding that teachers in those schools were being paid $30,000 less than the median income of Massachusetts school teachers. Uh, in the governor's budget, there is a proposal to fund the special education circuit breaker at 503 million, which is a 14% increase and specifically looking at um, covering most of this out of district school placement. I don't think it's at 100%, but I think it's, it's quite high. I wanna say 90, but we'll have to ask Manny if that's correct. Um, I think those were the main concerns of the Newburyport school system. So do you want to just start by asking me questions that I can then go and help us answer? Don, I, I have a question about what you just, you just said with that funding, you don't mean fully funding the tuition, you mean fully funding the increase in the tuition? Is that, I mean, that was okay, uh, but. Well, I mean, basically it says, the budget proposes to fund the special education circuit breaker at okay. 503 million. Right. Um, so 75% reimbursement. So we would get a, a higher level of reimbursement, but we're not talking about having our no. out of district placement fully funded. No. Right, no. okay, no. I just wanted to make sure. There'll be enough funding there to hopefully ensure that offset the increase. Seventy five percent is covered by the yeah. circuit breaker. Great. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Specifically, it says this investment includes a fifteen million dollar increase for relief to help districts adjust to a fourteen percent tuition increase at Chapter Seven Six Six Special Education Schools. Right. And it goes on to say, and there is a commitment to pursue an additional year of relief funding opportunities in a forthcoming supplemental budget. Okay. Right. So, yeah. So that's the part of, for, for all districts, for the city council and Phil, jump in if you would like. So there's extraordinary relief. So if you do have, for example, um, and this ha is happening to us. We have a scenario. We have a um, out of district placement uh, student for seventy thousand dollars. So that's what we anticipate. Students not making effective progress, you know, throughout the school year. Um, needs a residential, which is twenty four hour care. So that seventy thousand out of district placement tuition. Once that student goes to a residential, that cost is now four hundred and I think it's four hundred and seventy six. No, five twenty five. Five twenty five, which happened to us from July first to now, because you know student needs things change. So um, what um, Ms. Shan's saying is now we can apply for extraordinary relief because of that scenario yeah. um, through the state. Mm -hmm. It's not guaranteed that you do get, you know, but what it sounds like is the governor is adding money to that extraordinary relief for districts that have scenarios like that. Yeah. Um, for us, and I was talking to um, Council McCauley, as part of last year's budget, if you recall, we um, moved $300,000 into ESSER for the free full day tuition because we couldn't claim those students as part of our student enrollment because parents were paying. So this year, because we added those students, we did get a bump in our chapter 70. Mm -hmm. uh, it's three, you know, when we're looking at the uh, student enrollment piece, it was 370, so what was it? 376,000 or something like that for our tuition. So now those kindergarten students are part of our mm -hmm. student enrollment, which goes into the formula of chapter seven. Mm -hmm. So for, for our district, um, and this is the breakdown for every district in the Commonwealth, um, you know, for chapter 70. So last year we received uh, 4,681,000 mm -hmm. 
$1,433 for Chapter 70 funds. This year, um, as Ms. Sheehan uh, stated, we're at $5,661.45 with an increase of nine seventy eight seventy two. dollars So that's part of some of that, uh, the formula that goes into that. Mm -hmm. And that's what we did. Um, part of the documents that you have, we kind of gave an overview of school choice and how chapter 70 is calculated. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where we're at. Mid Superintendent, I just wanted, wanted to point out that Manny Cruz is in the attendees. Oh. oh, great. Would you please let him in as a, would you promote him to participant? Sure. Thank you. A question that I had, maybe you would to answer. We have to split that chapter 70 money with the charter school. Right? Yeah, so the chapter 70 money goes to the city and to the mayor. Um, and, and we obviously, as we receive funding for different grants, we, you know, we let the, the city and the mayor kind of figure out, you know, how much of that is going to go to the charter school and how much is coming to us. So, for example, we have 127 students that are going to the charter and our pupil, per pupil cost kind of follow those. Manny's students. declining to be promoted to panelist. <laughs> so he doesn't want the promotion. So for example, <laughs> try again. If five million uh is coming in for uh, chapter 70, then a portion okay, there of we go. would have to go to the chapter. Good. Significant portion. Good morning. Apologies. Mm -hmm. My my thumb my Two. thumb had pressed the wrong button. <laughs> Times one twenty seven students. So you would assume that that's the amount that's going to go over can i ask a quick follow on that so maybe for ethan ethan on the cherry sheet the uh, charter school sending tuition is that what we're talking about that's the number right on the cherry sheet yeah so that's the it's roughly 2.3 million so in the house one budget what i'm con confused about is um last year the sending tuition was 2.2 07 to be accurate and this year it's 2.267 so are we saying that actually that 2.267 is still subject to negotiation because it's a much smaller percentage increase of what what is shown on the cherry sheet to be going to the charter than what our overall increase is i don't know if that's better for phil or ethan or anybody if any if the question we'll even makes sense that first yeah do you know what i mean i, I know what you mean okay and the way i look at it i don't look at funding the specific buckets that get assigned or tagged to specific things it's all part of the overall funding number okay and since the charter school students are newburyport students mm -hmm. you take the number of students who are enrolled here within the, the public school district which is 2200 plus the charter school that's 2350 then you buy the amount of aid you're getting by the 2350 to get the average per student amount so as been said, that, that number has been pushed up a lot for the upcoming year because of changes in terms of the edge of kindergarten and um, the SOA and other things. So, okay. If you look at it, our per pupil costs haven't gone up that much. So, if they had the same number of students over there, you're right, Councilor, that number is not going to go up as much because our per pupil costs haven't gone up that much. What has gone up is one of our funding sources is going up a lot. Um, I think we're like 9.8% in terms of chapter 70 for next year. So, so when I look at it, I don't look at it as, you know, I've got this bucket of money that I have to sign up and this bucket of money. I've got all these flows that come to a certain number, and then we have to figure out how we pay for those. Okay. That helps or No, it, it, it helps. I guess what I'm not clear on is, is there an agreement that governs how much is it, you know, the, the, I understand the philosophy. The well. It's just so... We don't have control over that 2.267 number. It's state law. They come up with per pupil number. Got it. You know, if you look at our per pupil number, and they do make some adjustments at Desi because they will pull out some of the special ed costs. Got it. Because charter schools do not send students out of district. If a student needs, to, if a special ed student needs to go out of district, they're sent back to their home district. So therefore, mm -hmm. the per pupil they get is actually brought down a little bit because of that. Okay. So my last thing is so. It seems like the district is the winner in this. You're getting a bump of 967, 960K, and only 60 of that is going to the charter. I would say that the city is the winner in right. terms of getting mm -hmm. the 
increase in funding. But just that it's been a philosophical conversation for years about the charter and what they get versus the district and the breakdown. Of All I'm saying is out of the 960, if, I'm, if the cherry sheet is, I'm reading it correctly, the, the bulk of the increase comes to Newburyport Public Schools. That's all, just numerically. Maybe, Maybe I should leave the editorial. And the way, the way you look at it also, the cherry sheet, the funding that goes to the Charter School gets taken right off the state aid. Right. Here. That's how you can look at it. You, know, you think the state aid's this much, and the charter's going to get this right. much, the book's going to get this much before it ever gets here. Right. Right. The charter money comes right off the top. Yeah. Right. Just like the book does. And <laughs> okay. Can I just interject something? Sure. I just want, because uh, my colleague Representative Cruz is here, I just want to jump in and just say a few things about where the budget could go from here, because uh, there is a great deal of talk about adding more money to the education budget, budget. right? Mr. Cruz? Uh, yes, thank you so much, Representative Shandon. Uh, thank you to the honorable members of the school committee and city council that are present for having me today. Uh, I myself am still serving as the vice chair of the Salem School Committee. Uh, so I, like you all, uh, am a glutton for punishment uh, in my service uh, to public education. So uh, with respect to Representative Shan's uh, comments on um, the budget development process, as folks are, I'm sure, quite familiar with, um, the governor's budget provides kind of the baseline uh, for districts as we're starting to begin the budget planning process. Uh, and then the House uh, and the Senate are going to go next. So um, it is my understanding that right now we are in the midst of seven different hearings uh, through the Ways and Means. Uh, education recently had their hearing uh, earlier this week on Monday uh, in which uh, we had folks from MMA, uh, Secretary Cutweiler, various uh, advocates uh, who were coming in to kind of just describe the situation currently in public education post pandemic and what's needed. Um, so I would anticipate we'll see the budget on the House side uh, in the second week of April. Um, and one of the things that we still have an opportunity to do uh, as members of the of the general court is to advocate for particular increases. Uh, and so you're, you're reaching out to Representative Shonda at a really great time uh, in which she's gonna be able to uh, communicate with the chair around anything from uh, what you're experiencing with special education tuition increases, uh, any challenges that you might be having with respect to charter reimbursement. This always comes up for the members. Uh, and there's generally been a push uh, to try to um, increase uh, the funding that's going directly to districts and try to balance that sheet with respect to the charters. Uh, and then the other piece that I would just mention is that um, the per pupil number that you're seeing uh, in the H1, um, there's usually a, a, an advocacy push uh, from the members of the general court. Uh, and the house has been pretty good about this with respect to increases uh, in the per pupil allotments. Um, and so I would anticipate that uh, in the debate, we'll probably see a fair number of legislators, myself included, uh, who are gonna continue to push that this new allocation of funding uh, of education uh, it, it is going to go uh, also still to K through 12. I know that there's this burning desire to scale up early ed uh, and certainly uh, addressing the needs of higher education. Uh, mm -hmm. But fundamentally, I think that there's an understanding on the House side that the students that remain the most impacted and the budgets that remain the most impacted are K through 12, uh, especially with the looming cliffs that are coming in the in the upcoming fiscal years uh, with respect to ESSER dollars drying up. Um, and one of the things that I had a conversation with Representative Shand about um, earlier this week was that there has been an effort to try to address um, some of the technical challenges with respect to the Chapter 70 formula. So over the last four years, I've been working with now Lieutenant Governor Driscoll, um, Leader Peisch, uh, who was the former chair of the Education Committee, and Senator Lewis on trying to address some of the, the challenges in the Chapter 70 formula that were left unattended to. Uh, and this includes uh, some of the aid that goes to minimum aid communities, um, some of the technical aspects around below effort communities, um, and really also thinking about some of the redistribution elements uh, associated with the cap on contributions. So there is a legislative proposal that right now is in draft that I've briefed the representative on that I'm uh, leading on with Senator Lewis, Senator Lovely, and a few other folks that are uh, experiencing some challenges with Chapter 70, uh, in which we are seeking to, um, uh, number one, direct some of the dollars from the question one amendment uh, into the K through 12 system uh, mm -hmm. and to ensure that some of these uh, districts that have received um, technical penalties, either as minimal, minimum aid communities, below effort communities, uh, or that are rural, 
uh, have an opportunity to see an increase in their chapter $70. Um, and, uh, and, then, and then also trying to set up um, some form of a pothole account to try to address this in the short term. Uh, but then in the long term, I, we do need another commission that reexamines uh, our Chapter 70 formula uh, to ensure that uh, it is as equitable as it can be uh, for um, not only um, our rural communities, our smaller towns, uh, but to the municipalities that have really stepped up when it comes to public education uh, and are well above net spending and are really at the limits with respect to what they're able to contribute uh, locally. So I do uh, just want to share uh, with the members of this committee that there is a desire to try to address some of the inequities with respect to um, the Chapter 70 formula. Um, I don't imagine that we'll do something as sweeping um, as what we did with the Student Opportunity Act, but I imagine that we'd have a more targeted solution uh, in the long run. And the good news is that uh, because we have um, Lieutenant Governor Driscoll uh, in the administration, she's already taken a lead in this budget in trying to increase um, funding that's going to minimum aid communities. Uh, and there is a proposal that's currently tied to the larger bucket item uh, that would create a pothole account. So you should see an additional uh, supplementation if, if the Newburyport uh, public schools are in fact the minimum aid community. Um, so, uh, and those conversations remain ongoing with House Ways and Means uh, and with the Senate. And I'm actually on my way in today for my meeting with Chair Michaelowitz, uh, in which um, I've encouraged my colleagues like Representative Shand and others who are in minimum aid communities to continue to talk about um, the importance of redirecting some of the funding uh, to K through 12 districts um, from the excess revenues that continue to be collected here in the Commonwealth. Right, right. So that's what I have to share on my end. Happy to answer <laughs> any questions. Thank oh, you. And then another, another area of interest, I just wanted to see if you wanted to know more about where we are with the fair share amendment. Sure. Yes. So essentially we've created a, the governor has put forth the idea of having a stabilization fund. Uh, Essentially, with, we believe and have agreed that $1 billion will be collected in fiscal year 24, or actually 23, and in 24, we would spend it. Um, it's going to be split pretty evenly between education and transportation. I think transportation is getting $490 million, and education will get uh, $501 million. Um, there are a lot of discussions about where the money is going to go. Uh, you know, there are efforts to uh, stabilize the higher education system and make tuitions uh, less expensive, as well as building more green infrastructure. There was a long list, but I think for our purposes today, what we're talking about is um, increasing infrastructure, uh, particularly on child care for people who provide pre-K services. Uh, we're also talking about making a down payment on universal pre-K starting in the gateway cities. Uh, the governor has acknowledged that this is a major concern uh, and priority for her, but that this budget is not that. It is a down payment. It is a beginning toward universal pre-K. All right, and I don't think I missed, I mean, there's a the list of things that are on the education spending budget is long and some of it doesn't apply to us. We're not a rural, edu we're not a rural system. So that's where we are. And again, the point of the budget hearings is to really make a decision about whether the Commonwealth can live with this budget. And the budget does include some substantial tax breaks, particularly uh, among short-term capital gains, long-term capital gains, the estate tax. And so we're, we're in a, a robust discussion right now about what, you know, what are the needs of the communities and you know, how can we both invest in the right places and at the same time give tax breaks to those same um, either groups of people or industries. Great. Uh, Thank you, Don. Yeah, Mr. Cruz, I got a, a quick question on, so the um, chapter 70 formula uh, that was restructured. So Newburyport, we did get a bump. So we're pleased with that. Um, and then I know we're all working towards um, looking at special education and funding circuit breaker at the full 75%. You know, the other piece that, as you know, uh, being on school committee and understanding school, the transportation piece um, that's impacting, I would say that would be one piece that impacts all districts across the Commonwealth, regardless if you're rural, suburban uh, or urban. Is that also um, 
uh, emphasis, you think, as we're moving forward? As you said, there may be more pockets down the road um, for relief. Yeah, yeah. As, as all my school committee colleagues here know, transportation is the grand budget buster. Um, and certainly coming out of the pandemic, I mean, we saw significant uh, challenges with our transportation system. And then um, I'm not sure if Newburyport was acutely impacted by some of the recent waves of uh, migration, but then also uh, an increase in um, students that uh, are unhoused uh, who uh, are also in need of transportation services. Uh, and so this has been an issue here in Salem for sure. And it, it is across the Commonwealth. And I know that in the supplemental budget that is currently being negotiated by the conference committee, um, that there is some funding in there that is designated around some of the increased transportation costs. Uh, but in the long term, as a Commonwealth, we do need to have a conversation about how districts are um, on the hook for transportation. Uh, so I'd like to see that certainly be a part of the conversation as we think about what, what it's going to take to have a sustainable system uh, for public transit uh, for our students. Um, and I, I think one of the things that I'd love to see is the state really step in um, to kind of, uh, I think, provide a little bit more uh, regulation with respect to these private transportation companies. Uh, you know, we recently, uh, much to my own chagrin, uh, actually uh, defunded our, um, our public, uh, Salem Public Schools transportation uh, system uh, in favor of um, moving to a full contract with NRT. So we had a hybrid model before, uh, but as folks may be familiar with, once you start uh, going down the road of privatization, um, there's really some practices within the field that make it uncompetitive. So you really can't shop around for price after your first contract. Um, mm -hmm. And so, really speaking, I'd love to see the administration, uh, which the Lieutenant Governor having her there is really instrumental. She knows that this issue exists. Uh, mm -hmm. We need to come down and not only provide more funding, but also more guidance to districts. Uh, and I'd love to see more regionalization of some of these contracts with these private um, transportation companies who, quite frankly, they're going to each and every single district and pitting us against each other in their contracts. So um, yeah, absolutely. I think that this is advocacy that we need to be doing through both the MA, through MASC, uh, and certainly the legislature. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Superintendent, I would just add that in the supplemental budget, they're talking about covering regional transportation, but not city transportation. Yeah, I think for, for us, that's one of, yeah, special education trends. It's one of the driving factors um, as we develop our budget. I think we're well over a million dollars in transportation. We're, we're getting close. So from my perspective, from the voice from the other table, um, we talk about transportation. One is special ed transportation. That is blowing up for every district. It's, it's, you can't find drivers, and, and so the prices keep going up. But all in terms of regular transportation, the issue is really going to be we have to go out and bid next year. And as many of you are probably aware, um, all of those smaller bus companies are being gobbled up by a new entity out there. So NRT, Salter, and a few others are now actually all part of the same corporate conglomerate. So right. I'm very concerned we've got to bid what it's going to do to our pricing. Yeah, we've heard that too. Oh, okay. So in the interest of um giving Representative Cruz time to get ready for his meeting, which is an important one. Are there any other questions that we can answer for you at this point in time? <clears throat> or um, let me rephrase it. Are there things that you would like for us to advocate for as we go through this budgeting process? I hear special ed transport, but um, is there anything else specific? No, I'm, I'm also part of the North Shore Superintendents Roundtable and we have that legislative um, committee, subcommittee that's working uh, with Mr. Mm -hmm. Cruz, yourself, and other state reps. So uh, we're a very tight-knit group, um, mm -hmm. you know, 24 districts on the North Shore. So, um, you know, I, I think you are well informed on some of the challenges uh, mm -hmm. throughout the North Shore Superintendent's Roundtable. So mm -hmm. I don't have anything else to add. Okay. Just that 14% increase yeah. getting addressed. Yeah, so that was the other piece. And um, um, Representative Shannon, if you want to just talk, and maybe Mr. Cruz, just at the end of that OSD 14% increase uh, for special ed out of district tuition, um, you know, as you know, it's always been around 2%. So when we anticipate the increased right. bump, 
But that's significant for Newburyport. If we just take uh, level service, what we have now, that's a $600,000 increase. If those um, out of district placement tuition costs go up to the 14%. So I, that's, I, I'll take that one on. So I, first of all, the reason for the increase is that the teachers in that system were being paid $30,000 left per year than Massachusetts public school teachers. So, so in order for them not to unionize, they're drawing the money out. And so the, exactly so essentially is. we're talking about covering <coughs> this large increase, right? That's the $15 million increase to help districts adjust to this chapter 766 special education funding formula. So that is part of the budget. Representative Shan, didn't you say something 500 something million towards circuit breaker, right? Right, 503 million total to the circuit breaker. And again, remember, this is the floor. We have the opportunity to ask for more money. So 503 in the special education circuit budget, budget breaker, excuse me. Um, and then 15 million specifically to help districts adjust to the 14% tuition increase that you're talking about. Right. 15 million divided by how many? Well, our, our, our need is 600,000. Right, right. That doesn't go very far. Yeah, right? <clears throat> yeah. 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 and I think the representative Chance point, the, the, the base budget is what's been proposed in H1 by the governor. Um, and so there is a collection of reps right now, including Rep Sean, myself, uh, and others who are planning on every single one of us at our Ways and Means meeting, raising this 14% threshold and seeing if we can get some more um, funding allocated toward this particular issue, because uh, it is going to be a budget buster. I mean, I'm, I'm on the phone almost daily with my superintendent. We're trying to get as close to actual as we develop our final budget, uh, because Salem's mm -hmm. in a pretty precarious situation with Chapter 70. We've already had to make a few transfers that really put us in a tenuous situation where I don't want to make any reductions in force, but we'll have to do what's necessary uh, in order to serve kids here in Salem. So um, we certainly hear you on the need to address that. Um, I think there's a couple of reps who have traditionally been the circuit breaker kind of people. So Representative Shand and I can make sure that we're signing on to their letters, uh, but also raising it up at our respective ways and means meetings to ensure mm -hmm. that they're hearing from the, the membership and from our districts that this is this is one of the most pressing issues because no district plans for a 14% increase uh, in, uh, in those tuition costs. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, it's 10 o'clock, so I think we can let the state house people split. Uh, thanks so much for your time. And um, Representative Shan, we'll talk soon about all this. And um, everybody else, thank you very much. Ethan, can you stay on? Uh, uh, let me just add one thing. I Yesterday, I did spend time with Desi on behalf of the Amesbury delegation. So that is also something that we can, we can bring to the table if you have further questions about your cherry sheet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And just out, just so you know, the person in charge of make the uh, chapter 70 allocations lives in Newburyport. Oh, what's their house number? <laughs> I know. No, you wouldn't tell me either. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Representative Cruz, and good luck today. Thank you. Thanks. It's a pleasure. Take care, folks. Okay. Bye bye. Thanks. Thanks. Make sure. Did I ask another question? I don't know. No, I was going to say, yeah. you use your influence. Ethan, you're still here, right? I'm here. Okay, so you're just on audio, so we're just gonna let you sit here. In my influence, yeah. So maybe for Phil, so the chapter 70 from 4.6 to 5.6, do you know what the, what part of that is because of kindergarten and what part of it is because of Not student opportunity? Okay. I would really like to meet up to with Roger Hatch. Genius that Desi created this thing. Okay. And I'd just like to pick my dark alley and yell at him okay yeah. i do have and i'll have to find it but i i do have an email um stating that just the newberry core public school raised it i think it was over three hundred seventy thousand dollars it's because of that kindergarten so i'll find that and I okay. can send it to you. So, so maybe it's in that area like two Correct. thirds and a third yeah, I mean, there like is a that. positive impact because previously because Kindergarten was only half day, and the other half was you had to pay for it. Right. Kindergarten students only counted as half people. Uh, uh, so it's like doubling the number of kids. Correct. Okay. And then every year that 
formula will be accounting for those and, and then some other increases because the number of um, English language learners that we have because the Afghan refugees also play a factor in this as well right the one part of the chapter 70 formula that does not work in my opinion that's never worked is the way they calculate the special ed component it's always well underweighted to reality right sorry that was my editorial comment no no thank you um i thought it was just a fact i was writing it down so on, on that special ed component <coughs> you're mentioning does that really relate to you know how maps mass association approved private schools advocates for special ed increases because i i that i don't know I'm okay because I mean, traditionally, and I'm familiar with maps because I worked in special ed administration a long time ago. Uh, you know, generally the increase and is, isn't really two percent, it's generally between three and four percent every year. And then this 14 percent increase, I mean, it just strikes me that all of a sudden they're noticing that uh, the salaries are 30K under the average. But it's generally, you know, the whole maps that kind of drives that increase to special ed. That's association approved private schools. Yeah. So o OSD, the people that set the rates. So you, know, you have to credit the out of district placement right. people because they did, you know, it, it took us all <laughs> so every year they um, propose increases. Right. And so with that being said, because of inflation, because of the way the economy is right now, they made a great case of, you know, being yeah. underpaid and right. then. So when they came out in October, like when we all saw a 14% in our district placement, we were like, this is, you know, this is really outrageous. Um, and then so our association was really working <laughs> with the legislators saying, hey, if this stays at 14% and these out district placements raise their tuition costs 14%, it's gonna, you know, right off the bat, we're looking at $600,000 increase without even. <clears throat> You know, we, we have other stuff that we're doing to try to minimize those costs right now, but it is uh, significant. Um, and and so they they kind of, you know, not, not to get in turf wars, but, you know, and that's why like us, for example, we have two programs, our therapeutic program and our um, IDC program at the high school, which is like a transitional program for students with severe special needs. So we have them until 22. So we have room in those programs and we're reaching out to the local superintendents because if you had not right. a digital placement of $80,000, we could take on a student for 40 or 45,000 and save a district. So those are some of the things that we're doing. So we do have one student that has tuition in, um, in one of our programs, a therapeutic program. So, but yeah, it's, it's crazy. I just uh, just a point to be made um, that um, unless things have changed really dramatically recently, charter schools also pay significantly less than public schools do to their teachers. And I just I just wonder if you know if they're doing it for sped, then somebody's going to start advocating that we give a larger chunk of money to uh, charter schools so that they can bring up salaries. Correct. And so the other piece too that challenges the so. You know, obviously we work with everybody. Like there's a place for everybody, out of district placement, charter schools. But the other piece is um, if there is a student that's not making effective progress in a charter school and special education services are needed, then that student comes back to, let's say, Newburyport right. Public Schools. Right. And then we're the ones that are funding the special education right. services. So, yeah. So, so that's another cost. Right. So we have had some charter school students that have come back and we had to do out of district placement. Yeah. So, so Bruce, I think you guys have spent five years at a charter school. Mm -hmm. There's no case for a charter school. We won't school. hold it against them. Yeah, I, I don't know. know. <laughs> that's all the dark side. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there's charter schools can't make a case like the um, special ed schools that in terms of getting additional funding because they're getting the per pupil that we have. Mm -hmm. So they make a Put my business hat on. They're making a business decision as to what you pay your staff. And so, you know, when you look at it, when I was down in um, Renaissance down at Hyde Park, it's not a union. The teachers are complaining that they could go to Boston make a lot more money. Well, yes, they could. But I've always said that Boston has a salary schedule that no one can afford. Even Boston can't afford it. 
So the difference is philosophy where I was working is yes, we might pay you less and the teachers tend to be younger, but we also have two adults in every classroom. Whereas in Boston, you can make a boatload more money, but you have to be one person in that classroom with more students. Right. So, you know, it's a, it's a philosophical issue. Mm -hmm. So yes, on average, special, uh, special, on average, charter school teachers are paid less. Is it significant? It depends on where you are. Where I was down in um, first responding, and we look at data with the surrounding communities, and we weren't that far off. And so the, the, pack, the, the entire package of the benefits and everything else, we were very competitive in that case. So long as you say, they don't have a case to make up for that. Okay, just don't want to be quite blindsided. Yep. Um, can, can I just um, walk through something in my head and just tell me if it makes sense? So using around numbers, the state aid increases a million dollars, 4.6 to 5.6, but then you peel out 300, 300 to cover kindergarten, mm -hmm. which never hit our budget because we took it out of ESSER. So that mm -hmm. is a wash, which is in right. a good way. So right. that's 300. So now we're down to 700. And then at least according to the cherry sheet, the charter school increase, they'll, they'll get $60,000 more. So take mm -hmm. that off. So roughly, you know, out of the million dollars, let's say, again, to use round numbers, say we take off 400, there's about 600 that's left mm -hmm. that maybe we consider new, new mm -hmm. money that's not already encumbered by something else. So, so far, if I'm making sense, my question is, um, I'm basically trying to get to a sense of what's new mm -hmm. versus what's going to be absorbed by existing salary increases uh, that have already been uh, um, agreed upon in the, in the recent contract that was done and then just operating costs, electricity, and so forth. In, is there any new money or does it sort of all wash down to zero? And then just the, I came to the presentation briefly, I think it was last week, mm -hmm. but the asks were fairly, the numbers weren't huge, you know, 10,000, right. 18,000, 70,000. Mm -hmm. And then last piece is just, um, will there be any, any money for capital? I just wanted to talk about that a little bit too. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, it, does my analysis make sense? Am I thinking about it in a way that makes sense? Because this is this is your world, not mine. So I'm right. just trying to understand it. If I'm even thinking about it correctly. Well, there's another portion of the increase also is the Special Opportunity Act that was passed. And I'm fuzzy on the details, but there are specific requirements that we have to do in terms of getting that money. Got it. So that's another piece that's gonna get pulled out. Got it. So what's real new increase? Um, let me take a, a shot at it because I can do a little more. And Sean may have the yeah. answer already. I mean, I think I think that as part in what Phil and I are working on is that that whole fourteen percent that six hundred thousand dollars just for the coverage of the tuition. So if that comes true and something else doesn't break, your six hundred is going for, in other yeah. words, and then you're yeah. back to city budget, broad city budget. Correct. To let, try and let me interject yeah. right there. But the money we're getting for an increase. Could roughly offset the six hundred thousand, mm -hmm. right? So, as we speak right now, mm -hmm. we could be at a net zero. Yeah, circuit breaker. Right. Yeah. Circuit breaker is seventy five. Just chapter seven. Just, okay. Yeah. Right. So, you can see the extra six hundred that this fourteen percent increase mm -hmm. is roughly six hundred, and we're getting roughly six hundred minus the accounting that they just went through. Right. So we're conceivably at zero. Right. Correct. Um, not counting any net new increases in budget one or anything like that that goes on, right? Okay. So we're all in, in search of additional funds. I was surprised to hear that that didn't include any of the millionaire spec, whatever you want to call it, right. in fiscal year 24. Right. 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 They're, going to, they're going to take that money, put it in fiscal year 24, and then start spending it in fiscal year 25. Yeah, well, well there's uh, some time in terms of when you yeah. get the taxes. <laughs> well, they'll yeah. have they'll have it. They'll okay. have it. And but my understanding is it's not going to K to twelve. And with their plan that they've laid out sure. is is transportation, um, a lot of transportation needs, right? And um, higher education, um, with with that asterisk of uh, 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 child care, right? So it's it's not that that is the big gap right is the k through 12 right. um and we'd all be lucky if we got it at 25 because transportation is going to go up again right right you, you know that we we again. Again. so they, yes, they yeah, yeah. Oh. so i just had a question about the timeline here because it, it sounds pretty optimistic that they're going to offset that the state is going to offset these the 14 percent increase 
but I'm just trying to figure out if we'll we'll know that in time no. for our so, budget to reflect yeah. that. So when we, yeah, when, you're laughing. Yeah, and, we're, right. When we do our planning, so we don't even, we don't bank on chapter seven. So we're not saying, hey, we need, the only thing I'm happy about is that we know the cost of kindergarten was covered through our enrollment, right? So we, you know, we utilized 300,000 for ESSER with the understanding enrollment and then whatever that formula was when they kick it back it showed like yeah cost neutral we got uh free full day kindergarten for the district those numbers are going to continue to be part of the formula so as we begin our budgeting process we look at all of those all of the grants and all the resources and all of that not depending on the governor uh to reimburse us and all of that if it comes to light then that's wonderful. All of a sudden, if we say, hey, we have this other piece of money, but as we're doing our budget, we're not really counting on um, some of that funding to, to come So we do have we're to budget, budget for the 14% increases. We do. And, and so right now we're reaching out to the individual, because remember those out of district placements, you know, because they, they heard what, you know, we're trying to do. So in the sense, like if they're going to increase by the 14%, right and we can undercut them with our own programming then we'll pull we'll see if we can pull some of those students out of there so what well, we're doing kind of in your plan forever right? yeah exactly and the good news is with all the literacy work that we've done um in our uh language-based program in a year and a half we haven't had any students go to <laughs> so every year we'd be sending a handful of students to landmark for seventy five thousand dollars. so for a year and a half we haven't had it we're building up our therapeutic program with the same idea to pull some of those students back that social emotional needs and then our graduate program. So, um, but anyway, so, yeah. So, um, well, the, the, to go in reverse order. So on the special ed, <laughs> what, I, what I guess I don't understand is that um, if the if the state's supposed to pick up everything with the circuit breaker, they pay us 75 to 75. So that's the savings. So by yeah. bringing them in, you save the 25%. That's basically the, that's what you get. No, we would save. So if we brought a student, let's say you're a student in a therapy program and one of them is called Solstice. Yeah. We pay $90,000 a year, right? Okay. So we develop our own programming. And that's why last year, if you remember the budget, we were putting staff in, a lot of yeah. special ed staff. Yeah. So let's say we have four kids out of district placement at 90,000. Yeah. But now we have a program that mimics the same services they're getting out of district. Once we bring them back, there's no tuition costs, no transportation costs. So we could be saving around $100,000 per student. So, yeah, I'm sorry, so if I'm, you know, the way the circuit breaker works, when you send a student out of district, you first are on the list for 50,000. So if the out of district tuition hundred thousand, okay. you pay the first fifty. Circuit breaker then reimburses you for seventy five percent of anything above fifty. Right. So yeah. we'd be we'd be end up paying um on that for sorry eighty seven thousand. They give us thirteen thousand back. It's yeah. so like a rebate. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But you know we don't get the whole hundred percent back because Jay Sullivan is the head of the planning side. Tends to like to say, if I give you all the back, you're going to skin in the game. Got it. So, and then, the, sorry, just one other follow, just on the timing. So is this where you you typically would budget out of choice and then to make up that gap? And then when the when this final budget comes down, recently anyways, it has come out more favorable. So then you're able to not spend the choice. Did I just- Yeah, so we, what we've been doing and Phil can talk better is utilizing, so we utilize our grants, we utilize choice to defray the appropriations for the city. So let's say the overall budget eight percent, but we know we can utilize two point three percent of that through grants and choice. That's what we'll do. And also, because we have the circuit breaker reimbursement, we have been very successful here in the last X number of years of carrying it that over. In other words, circuit breaker money that we get this year is for last year's expenses. Right. So we always try to end the, the current year with the money we got reimbursed, so that we have a buffer going into the fall. Yeah. Correct. But this year we have a bump in terms of unexpected students going out. Right. We will be digging into our buffer to get us through. And then going into next year, you know, we'll finally get reimbursed for our increased costs this year. So you're always, they're always catching up to you. So when you have a year where something goes up a lot, it's a like year or two bump where we've got to come up with the cash flow to cover it until the reimbursements are coming through. Right. 
Thank you. Sorry. Sorry. No, I'm, okay. I'm good. Thank so you. can I? Yeah. Am I interrupting anyone? No. No. no, I just I wanted to be clear on the timeline, and yeah. you did explain that we we do have to budget for these increased costs, and then correct, yeah. and not our fingers, sit and wait around, yeah. right? Yeah. No. All right. I, thank I, you. That was that was it. Uh, yeah. So, in the in the placement process that you guys have gone through, right? It's um, we we have a sunk cost in that, right? We our sunk cost is our staff that we've invested, the updated programming that we have to pay for, you know, those types of things. Mm -hmm. Um, is there a, uh, are you guys doing, you know, in my world, we do a profit and loss to see how our income is coming in, uh, with our in placements versus, cause we're not, we're not saving the 90,000. We are saving a portion of the 90,000, mm -hmm. um, because we have staff. Yeah. We, we have, have staff, staff in the right? program. Correct. So, mm -hmm. um, are we, are, are we at that point? Are we, have we reached the break even yet? Do we have a projected break even of where this in placement? Yeah. Well, is we just don't like that. For example, um, so we brought in our therapeutic program at the high school, for example, we brought three students back. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have two staff, so two staff at you know, $65,000 and then a uh, paraprofessional. So that staffing in place brought three students back yep. at 90000 So there is a cost savings, which we start to bring down those special ed costs, yep. which then, you know, when you look at the out of district, tuition increase if we can bring back so that's part of the other plan that so if we have to pay six hundred thousand you know taking all of yeah, our yeah. kids now move it in but if we can meet with parents by the end you know between now and the end of the year and say hey listen here's a program that we've developed we'd love to have your child come back then that you know cuts into those tuition costs but parents have to agree to that yeah mm -hmm. they don't sometimes mm -hmm. they don't yeah, no, I, yeah, listen, I, exactly. I get, I, I get that. That's not, I mean, the ultimate it's goal is to develop your own program. And obviously, it's for us, it's to have Newberry Port kids in Newberry Port, number yeah. one. But number two, to kind of bring down those special ed costs. So we're not like waiting for the state to help us. We're trying to figure it out. Yeah, I, I, I get it. I, I just have a follow up on that because sure. in the example you used, right, it, and I'm not holding you to it, I just want to say in the example you used, if we're saving $90,000 a kid, and we're spending 65 plus benefits, we're spending $80,000 uh, to do that. We're really saving, you know, potentially we're only saving $30,000 in this program. And like, really my longer term question is, when do we break even? When do we project breaking even? The three students broke even, but when is this revenue positive? When is this, well, you know, because every student you have, you need, you know, uh, student parent, uh, student teacher uh, ratio. So, you know, is seven the right number? Is, you know, three the right number because yeah. it's a break even? And like, that's example, my question. When we look at, so if you look at since I've been here, right, my fifth year, so we were sending a lot of kids to Landmark, right? So, and those students that are at Landmark, we may not bring them back, but we know like every year, if we were sending four to eight kids to Landmark every year, we know after a year and a half, those service we parents are happy with our programming in district programming mm -hmm. so we haven't sent kids out there do you know what i'm saying so we kind of i started. do i understand and what that's trying to do and that's yeah and that's kind of you know what what we're trying to do those the three students that we brought back um at ninety thousand dollars you know it's two hundred seventy thousand dollars a year that was going out of district tuition right yeah the other part of the analysis we got to bring in is also the cost of it, too. Right. Right. And that 90000 does not include the cost of it. Correct. Yeah, I, I so bring just it, yeah. 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 the savings. It's just, it's, just savings. it's one area yeah. that we look at really hard. Um, so the cost up front in our budget, you might say, oh, wow, they're adding more teachers. Why are they doing that? Because we know if we can develop these programs mm -hmm. in the district, we're going to almost like stop the bleeding with special aid costs. I suppose so you're asking about it's really like a 30% um, saving or $30,000, you know, savings or whatever. Could be. Right. It could be. But, you know, the, the question is like, when do you get to zero? I don't want to speak for these people, but I can imagine that they would be like, I don't care if it's zero because those kids are back right. where they belong. That's a huge part of it. It's not just the right. money. Right. You know, you're sending a kid on a bus for 40 minutes each direction every day and not being with their peers who live right. around the corner. At least right. for That's worth whatever that tiny you know, thirty thousand dollars we get. I don't care if it ever gets to zero personally, because all those kids are here. Why would you want to send all your kids somewhere else? Right. That's more important to me. 
the money is. I mean, if you still don't want to lose money, but I'm not trying to make a profit, Correct. profit either in my role here. Yeah. And I would guess these three feel similarly. Yeah. So, so I don't want my words. My uh, steam comp. I don't want my words being misconstrued. No, I know, but I just want to make sure it's not just about money. That's all. Well, we we are in a bunch of meetings, and I know. So, but secondly, my question was, you know, we've listed this as potential in placement as positive revenue, right? That that's what we've had a discussion about today. Potential so, positive, yeah. Potential, right? And potential positive revenue is cost avoidance. So, you know, as the example used is we're avoiding $90,000 a year per student. Plus, let's say, just for the sake of argument, another $10,000. Right. $200,000. <laughs> okay. okay, but right. let, let's say all of a sudden the whole conversation is it's $300,000. Instead of two seventy, dollars we'll give you $10,000 each. It's $300,000. There's, there's an offsetting cost to that. And that offsetting cost is you have to um, train, you, you have to hire the professionals to do it. You have to train them. You have to stay uh, on top of the um, uh, programming that has to happen and all of that kind of stuff. So there's a cost. So the cost avoidance of 300 is going to cost us $250,000 to avoid that. So that is a cost avoidance of $50,000. It's a, and, and oh, by the way, because they can stay local, that's another benefit to that. But, you know, if, if it's costing us three hundred thousand dollars to save three hundred thousand dollars, then that's a net zero. But if it's costing us five hundred thousand dollars <laughs> to save three hundred thousand dollars, then like the bus transportation, we might want to have to do private placement because that's a cheaper way to do it. And so, but that's not what I'm here. The third you guys think it would ever be cheaper to send a kid out of district, even with all the extra staff and benefits and all of that. And, and so the other piece too is we. Yeah. We've also remember part of what we've done, and I think we've done a, a good job in school committee, is we've taken our our staffing patterns, reallocated some of our special education teachers who are already part of the in developing those programs. Mm -hmm. So we're not adding, you know. Um, so we tech, every year we look at our special education services, we look at the programming and is it effective? And if it's not effective, then we repurpose to address the needs of the kids. The literacy program in the uh, language space is a prime example. We've had success with that, with our own staff. And then taking a look at the high school therapeutic and then the IDC program, it's already in existence. It's kind of remodeling that those staffing patterns to address those needs. Because we feel social emotional <laughs> students that are out of district place and the transitional for our uh, severely special needs students up till 22. Those two programs that we have in place, we feel like those are the type of students that we think we can develop and bring back, not send out. There are some students that require a lot of needs in the residential, for example, uh, that's a significant cost. You know, I think we have seven students residential that's over 2.4 million just in the services that so those are things that we yep. look at and, and it's not like and I think we've been progressive in the sense of not waiting for the state and throwing our hands mm -hmm. up and say oh well you know special ed you know we'll just see it's like we kind of just take our own issues and try to deal with it within our operational budget so what were you going to say Sarah yeah I just wanted to add a piece in terms of the the budget puzzle that you were just alluding to um there's now potential we have room for these programs to grow in terms of students without adding cost for staff and we at this point have one student who from is from another district who will be paying us tuition the, the out of district tuition so that's right. added revenue mm -hmm. um i don't know how much more room there is there but i know you've been reaching out to other Correct. districts to say hey you know, that tuition's going up. How about you pay us a little bit less? Right. You know, we can undercut those programs and Correct. then we get the revenue. Correct. So uh, that's, I mean, I think that's a big piece of what you were just talking about. And it's a lot easier if transportation. Fund those right. programs and then get the tuition from other communities. Right. Right. I'm all for and that. And the thing you have to be, sorry, the mm -hmm. thing you have to be cognizant of is to have the same outputs and results that the uh, the specialized programs have, right? And because if you're not in line with that, then you're saying, well, it's not quite the same, 
right? And, and right. so ideally we're offering something that's attractive very to similar communities. Yeah. Similar, similar yeah. in output results and less cost. And that should be a win. That's the goal. So um I, I think it's a, it's an important conversation because it's one that's really hard to wrap your head around. But I do think part of it, I guess one diff difference, I guess, and maybe in thinking among some is cash flow versus income. I mean, I think I hear a lot about revenue, and I think what I've learned is schools are always just looking for more to come in, more to come in, and counselors think a little bit more in terms of P&Ls. We think of the bottom line, what falls out the bottom. So I get that schools have a cash flow game in a lot of ways because of the staff. You have a huge staff cost, so you're always looking for just more money to come in, and I, frankly, I look sometimes at choice as a cash flow play, um, this tuition for special ed as a cash flow play, and I think the counselor's point, and mine too, um, is that you know, the bottom line matters too. And, and so we can absolutely have a policy goal of saying we want to have more kids here. And there's a value to that that's sort of not something we put that we're not talking about in terms of saving money. At the same time, it's important to know if we're subsidizing that and to what degree, because that comes maybe is coming from other students, right? So there becomes an equity issue about does everybody, if you end up spending $200,000, you, us, to, to bring one kid in, you have all these other kids and it's the same argument with the charter, right? We're trying to have this equitable spend across to some degree. It's hard to have to look at income. And then the other couple things are um, capital is, is another thing. I mean, it's as long as you have the space, you know, and you don't end up having incurring this, you know, okay, if you bring a special program right. in that requires space, mm -hmm. that's a huge problem, right? Because right. now you have capital issues and you just physical, you might have inability. And then I also worry about, um, like anything else, you know, if you have specialties and then you have a year where you don't need that specialty, mm -hmm. right? If you can't reallocate them to something else, mm -hmm. you are in a tough position. You carry them mm -hmm. or you let them go and then right. you try and rebuild the program later. Right. So I'm just trying to put in some of how maybe counselors think about it a little bit in terms of we're saying, okay, we usually look and say, this is a policy goal we want to have. And then we say, if we want to subsidize it, we should be transparent about, okay, yeah, you know, are we bringing kids in primarily to get mm -hmm. them in the district? Are we bringing them in primarily to save money? Is it some combination of both? What if those two things are at odds with each other, which they certainly can be? And, um, you know, we we have a similar analog with like our city solicitor, right? We, we want to have specialty city solicitor who can do like a spe special kind of law. We would never want to hire somebody for that. But if it becomes a big enough need, maybe we would. But then what if we have two years where we don't need that? So that's all I think. And I, I concur. I mean, I think the capital is staffing the long-term implications of some of these things. Unfortunately, it sounds like we don't have any shortage of need, which is, you know, right. un unfortunately a reality. So some of that, <clears throat> the staffing questions about like, hey, you need another teacher and all this stuff. Sean's done a great job of just the reallocation. So even like Lisa Furlong, right? Right. She didn't cost any more. No. Because she got more money for her new job because Correct. we reallocated other people. Yeah, we, uh, we had a STEM coordinator, district STEM coordinator within the operational budget that we shifted because of Lisa Marie's strengths and curriculum instruction. Can I just ask one last question? When you solicit these other communities for the special ed, is that choice or is that like to where we're, we're considered out of district? Yes. We're, we're, we're not a district program, so therefore we can charge whatever, whatever rate we want to charge. And this is something new. So this isn't, um, this is a an avenue that I think only we're pursuing. And so we did receive one student um, in the therapeutic program. So it's kind of like piloting to see if it's going to work. If they have success, which they are right now, then I can market. And I'm not marketing for the whole state. I'd be looking at Amesbury, Triton, Pentucket, because, you know, talking with them, you know, they may see, you know, because everyone's going to need a kind of a budget crunch. And they're looking at cost savings. So if you're a superintendent in Pawtucket and you have you're sending say two students in a transitional program and it's costing you 180 thousand, you know, 180 thousand dollars, and you're looking at your budget and you're trying to figure out where can I save the money. You know? So that 180 that they could undercut, you know, to us might save a teacher, an algebra teacher. You know what I mean? So it's so we don't own that student the same way with choice though if there's a, if you can't take them the next year because we have a need you don't have to, to accept them but there's also there's no That's sort of breaker or any of those no because it would be a hundred percent cost of the spe our special ed program yeah. for them so that's one where 
the profit and loss is critical, right? You should, that's a business, right? You're, you're it's, it's almost would be like an enterprise fund yeah. in a sense in, the, in that you, but if, you know, it's hard to allocate costs, right. I can imagine, because that person does. And as we, and piece two, that's really important, is, is as we're presenting our budget, remember, it's, you, there's parents and that are associated with those numbers. Sure. So when I say, for example, I would never say that publicly, residential, you know, seven students are costing a lot of money. If you're a parent listening, you know what I mean? So sure, as we as we talk around special ed, we got to be, you know, a little cognizant of how we're explaining things. Um, because right. it doesn't, if you're listening, <laughs> you're that parent and right. you're like, I can't believe that I'm a money, you know, I'm well, this. For example, during the campaign, I was going door to door and I had come out and said something about, you know, we've done a lot with working with within the district to try to bring some of these kids back. And I knock on someone's door who is completely happy with their out of district placement for right. my special ed child. And you, you got an earful. I got an earful. Right. You know. I was going to say there is those parents out there too that are just yeah. very happy yeah. with their yeah. parents. But parents, it's nice having it's nice bringing those programs to have options. And in the, in the, in the, the right and the needs and the disabilities that we feel we can educate here. I mean, the the students that are at, at residential <clears throat> are so significant. We could never duplicate the needs of those students. Well, that wouldn't be cost effective. Yeah. Right. Correct. One last question, I I guess on this is that um, it it um, it's it's a potential for us right now. But the state always seems to catch up that says, well, if you're doing this, we're going to subtract this from your right. uh, your calculation and aid. Right. right. And have keep we it seen under it? the radar. Right. Have, <laughs> we, have <laughs> we seen it? You know, especially right. there's the other program that the, the mayor had mentioned the other night is that, you know, potentially bringing employees with a tuition program, et cetera, along the way. Um, you know, is there any inkling that we've heard that, you know, the state will adjust? our funding formulas because something like that is going to happen. No, we're, I think we're looking at that because um, one of the pieces with school choice is you're falling under the a state program. So you, mm -hmm. although we're only getting, uh, you, you're receiving, let's say $5,000, but you're getting that $5,000 every year the students here. If you tuition in, and this is what we're looking at, um, you're, not, you're not getting that money every single year. You know what I mean? So if, so let's say I say I'll pay sixteen five. My son's in third grade. I give the district sixteen five, but the following year, I'm not giving. So now all of a sudden, now if my student needs services, they're not going to be part of like some of the laws. Do you know what I'm saying? They're not going to be part of school choice. They're not going to be part of circuit breaker. But so, is that sixteen five every year they're going to pay, or is that only one time? Well, that that's what I'm about? saying. Yeah. So that those are the things we haven't seen. Um, you know, we're looking. You know, through the, we're looking to do our research on that. Yeah. You yeah. know, tuitioning in. Um, you know, we do have our uh, exchange program, but that's just for the seniors. So if you're a senior yeah. from Brazil, you tuition in, you pay the full tuition. Yeah. But you're only here for a year. Yeah, uh, but I, I I I may have mis uh, um, not asked the question correctly, right? And so all I was kind of getting at is I, I know these programs are early. Is do we think there's a rumbling that the state might hold that against us for any of these innovative right. programs you're trying to run? Right? If you bring right. in a student at ninety thousand, for example, mm -hmm. will the state say, well, you don't need ninety thousand in your in your spend right. reimbursement, so yeah. therefore we're going to take it off the top, right? Yeah. Have we seen any inkling to that? The answer I hear is no. no. But not not under special yeah. education. Well, okay. Okay. Our, our students correct. Mm -hmm. Right. We're not in our numbers. We, we don't go through the circuit breaker board. That's the sending district that they have to okay. those students. And we we've sent okay. just when I was a principal at Beverly High, um, we sent. Uh, there was a program in Marblehead, a uh, social emotional program uh, that we would send some of our kids to instead of sending them out to like a solstice and stuff. Um, so it's 20 to 11. The whole idea about this was to like, give the council a leg up before we get to May. So you can bring it to your budget people at like your next meeting. Say, we talked about this, give all those details or to the rest of your or rest of the council. Is there anything you got all the you know, from November till last week's budget yeah, presentation. I did get it, yeah. Um, are there some does, things as we does, Do you guys want to, yeah. you or Steve want to say anything about the budget? I missed that meeting on Monday. I said Alex Costello. I have no regrets. Um, 
do you have anything you want to say to the council about that presentation? <laughs> Wouldn't have been great. Yeah, it was well, let me tell you, it's the best calendar meeting we've ever had. <laughs> yeah. The calendar next year when like you go on away, we'll schedule the calendar. I called for discussion that was not. I still let everybody know I was going to vote no. So the whole vibe of the meeting, I thought, was better too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sing. People are happy. Um, no, I was just been calling people. Yeah. Do you have anything you want to say to the council or anything about the that? The latest budget presentation and then you guys can ask questions about this on not about the latest budget presentation but about what you're saying in terms of programming what you're really looking for is a proper economy of scale i used to work on these programs up in new hampshire and uh and i've seen them succeed i've seen you know surrounding districts send the district i work for kids and what happens in new hampshire is in the springtime they have town meeting and they decide where they want to raise taxes. And as a result of, you know, taking these kids and didn't have to raise the taxes. So, but you have to find that economy of scale. You also have to have parents agree to have you, the kids come into the program. Dover, New Hampshire, about 15 years ago, had a really outstanding program that they drew kids into. But you also have to keep your services up. Mm -hmm. And the only last thing that I, I want to say, and it probably isn't, uh, uh, well, I'll just say it. One of the things with the charter school is if they're not providing services, special ed services, and all of a sudden the student needs them, then they have to come back to a new report. A new report basically picks up the pieces and the cost. So maybe that's something we have to examine, take a look at the last five years. How many kids have we had? But you, don't get a, you don't get a rebate to the following year. You don't get a rebate for that lost kid. So, yeah, I mean, I, I and 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 but but this is also where I think they need, and I'm not saying I don't know to, to the degree of collaboration we have with the charter school, but I think it's important that you know our administration works with their administration to to take a look at where we see shortcomings, where we see things that we need to address. Because I can tell you, in my experience as a school committee member, I've I've had you know I've advocated for a handful of charter school families who have had their kids come back to the district for services and uh it is uh you know it's it's a it's a factor and if we can work together with the charter school i think that'll be a good thing and you know help uh help maybe them better assess the needs and us ultimately provide better services to that student who is you know you know a, a child that you know would be poor. Yeah, and I think as we develop our budgets, if there's, you know, I have an understanding of what, uh, you know, the city council is kind of looking at a little bit more, so I can incorporate some of that uh, into it. Is there other areas as we're preparing that you think would be helpful? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, just a, a quick, not not to discuss today, I know we're running out of time, but I think one, number one would be the, uh, the impact, the salary just as a conversation around salary. So we have a new contract, right? I think last year, three, three, and two or something along those lines, three, three, uh, three, three, two, three, two, two. two. Three, two, two. Um, but one co conversation that happens all the time is obviously three, two, two doesn't mean the salary goes up 3%, right? <coughs> We're going up the ladder. So there's all these other retirees. And, and so I think getting an actual, uh, you know, based on if we just took a very simple, added all, all the salaries from 22, all the salaries from 23 and just said what's the change it would be instructive to to help us understand what we're doing the second one is um definitely esser you know that conversation continues so what's coming off what is be, it being replaced with financially or are there any things we did that we won't do again that are either no longer needs or that we simply think we can't we can no longer provide and then um the third one would definitely be um Capital. Brian came to our meeting a couple of weeks ago and talked about some elevator type things. But um, this year, uh, it'll be the first year we do CIP and budget together mm -hmm. because the state finally passed our home rule charter change. So um, we're not doing two separate processes for CIP and, and another one for budget. And I'm hoping to just get everybody in once, uh, maybe for a little bit longer. But instead of making you come two nights, as we've often had to do, come for one. But um, I think some counselors had questions about 
what the capacity is for the school to handle any capital inside of its own budget, which I guess was done many years ago, not since I've been on that I've ever seen that, other than small things I think that come up, but also what maybe a review of what's been bought in the last couple of years, what's been done, whatever, and then um, what the top the top things are. I know that the, um, the lab thing is very much in question, um, mm -hmm. unrelated directly, I guess, to NPS, but at, certainly Nexus would be Whittier and their project, which, with which they're going to be, I'm sure they're going to be asked annoying questions about when they come in. There's no way that's going to happen. Yeah. Every, I mean, all 11 have to vote for it. But all of us are just looking at it and, and you know, there's trepidation, right? So I'm just, I'm just saying, you know, so that's important. And then, um, so salary capital, ESSER, um, I think, I think those are probably some of the, you know, some of the questions. And then, and then choice has sort of now become a bit of a perennial conversation. So and, um, and the mayor mentioned on Monday this uh, new idea to have teachers be able to bring their their kids. Um, city employees. City employees. Oh, okay. Maybe some just more info about what that is. That choice or is that? No, that'd be outside of choice. Uh, so tuition. it's like tuition, like the other thing. So, but well, anyways, that that one of the questions will be how does tuition get set, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming you could set a tuition. You want to set a tuition that's really reasonable because you said it was a retention, an employee yeah. retention idea. Right. Okay. Assuming right. you're not going to charge them like, I, I don't know. 60. That's that's well, it has to be what it actually costs. Like, well, I don't know. I don't like sixty-five. Yeah. Right. But choice, we get five thousand, so we get a third of what it actually costs. But if it's outside of choice, you won't get. But anyways, that's just yeah. these are some no, of the cards that will be positively about it. It's been very consistent since 1990. <laughs> right. so we can Bruce. count on that money. So, but I would, <laughs> if that's something we would end up voting on, that I would certainly want to vote for. Yeah the minimum what the actual cost is not less just because they work here yeah no i i, I mean, these, the these are though. just the question I mean, so we're not supposed to make money off this we're supposed to it's supposed to well, be so, get employees yeah, off. So yeah, jim's point has to be zero our operational budget so yeah yeah we're not talking about it. yeah and okay. my um colleagues couldn't make it today from budget but i will certainly reach out and mm -hmm. ask everybody to provide and you know thoughts questions and i recorded time. this too so i can yeah. send you the link yeah and stuff that's my best. I could try and give a little heads up. All right. Insight into where the conversation might might trend. But thank you. Yeah. For right. inviting. Uh, Thanks for coming in, guys. And, thank you. Uh, move to adjourn. So moved. Second. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 This is your awesome. meeting. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. We we canceled the budget because we didn't make. I didn't see you guys so. stand up. So that was no, a good no, no. <laughs> sort of bittersweet to reflect on the irony that. Um, when I chaired the 